Natural resources are all around us. What is a natural resource? Let's look at those two words, natural and resource. In the word natural, we have a hidden word, nature. So, a natural resource is something that nature made or produced. Trees, water, rocks, and animals are all natural resources. They are all products of nature that can be transformed into something humans can use. Water is one example of a natural resource that has multiple uses. For example, it can be used for drinking, for transportation, or it can produce electricity. Coal is another example of a natural resource used to produce electricity. About half of the electricity in the United States is produced by burning coal. Animals are another natural resource. Animals are used in many ways, for food and transportation and clothing. For clothing, we wear wool, leather, silk, and fur. All are produced using animals. Plants are also natural resources. We eat many plants, but we wear plants as well. Jeans are made from cotton, and some shirts are made of linen, which comes from the flax plant. Petroleum is another natural resource, and it is not only used to fuel your parents' car. You also may be wearing it. Yes, wearing petroleum. Fabrics like polyester, acrylic, and spandex are all made from petroleum. The next time you get dressed, check the tags on your clothes. You may be surprised what natural resource you are wearing. But natural resources are not all the same. Some are renewable and some are non-renewable. First, let's look at renewable resources. Let's take apart this word to understand what it means. Re, new, able. Re means to do something again, like in reset or reuse. So, in this case, the word renewable means to make something new again and again and again. So, a renewable natural resource is one that nature can make again and again, quickly and easily. Let's go into the woods to see how this works. I have a house in the woods and there are no restaurants around, so we need to hunt in order to eat. We see that there are 10 snowshoe hares on this piece of land. I capture two and make a nice stew. Mmm. A year later, I go back to the same land. How many animals are left? Eight? Are we sure? A typical hare has two to three litters a year with five to ten young in each litter. And these young hares can make their own young by the time they are six months old. So even when some hares are eaten by predators, like the red fox or the Canadian lynx, we are still likely to find 10, 15, or even 20 hares when we come back next year. Nature makes new hares again and again. That is why we say that hares and other animals are a renewable resource. Plants are another example of renewable resources because they can be grown again and again. But what about petroleum? It may take 10 million years or more for nature to produce petroleum. When it takes that long for nature to make something, we call that a non-renewable resource. Fur-bearing animals are examples of renewable natural resources. But what is a fur-bearing animal? Your dog has fur, but it is not classified as a fur-bearing animal. In North America, a fur bearer is an animal that is used to make clothing and other products while respecting regulations that control capture methods and hunting seasons. Many animals you know are part of this fur bearer group. Foxes, raccoons, beaver, minks, muskrats, and coyotes are well-known and abundant North American fur bearers. Let's look at two very abundant and interesting North American fur bearers, the beaver and the fox. A beaver and a fox live in different types of natural environments that we call habitats, and each animal has developed specific traits in order to survive and thrive in those habitats. First, the beaver. Beavers are a semi-aquatic species that spends a lot of time in the water. They make their homes near running water where they build dams to create ponds and sometimes even lakes. These ponds provide protection for beavers and help them to transport the tree branches they use for food. Because beavers spend most of their time in water, they have several adaptations that allow them to hold their breath for 15 to 20 minutes at a time. As soon as a beaver dives into the water, their nostrils and ears close to keep out water. 
Their transparent eyelids close as well to protect their eyes underwater, but allow them to see clearly. While underwater, they need to carry branches, their main food, so they have the ability to close their lips behind their teeth, keeping water out of their lungs. Their dense fur, round form, and webbed feet help them to keep warm and swim well as they transport branches and build their dams and houses. Beavers are herbivores. Herbivores are animals that only eat plants. Humans are known as omnivores because we can eat both plants and meat. Beavers have curved, flat front teeth. These flat front teeth help them gnaw on wood, giving them the nourishment they need and the ability to build those dams. The beaver's teeth have two layers of enamel, one softer than the other, so that as they gnaw wood, one layer wears faster than the other, automatically sharpening their teeth. Like other rodents, a beaver's teeth are constantly growing. Now for the fox, in this case, a red fox. The red fox is an example of a terrestrial fur bearer. That means a fox makes its home on land. The red fox is usually found in and around forests. A fox's long legs, narrow shape, and padded paws give it the perfect combination of speed and silence to hunt prey in the forest and meadows. And unlike the beaver, which is a herbivore and only eats plants, the fox is a carnivore. They prefer to eat meat, feeding on small rodents, snakes, and birds. A fox's small and pointed teeth are a telltale sign of their desire for meat. Both the beaver and fox have two layers of fur to keep them warm. The top layer for both animals is the guard hair. The guard hair on the fox protects it from injury when it runs through a forest. The beaver's guard hair is much denser than the fox's. It protects the beaver from branches as it swims underwater and helps keep it dry. The second layer of fur, closer to the animal's skin, is called the underfur. The underfur provides insulation for the animals. It is this dense underfur that keeps the animals warm. Just like you, a fox has a home and a neighborhood, which is called a territory. A fox's neighborhood is just big enough to provide food for the fox and its young. Male and female foxes, along with their cubs, will share a two to three kilometer square territory, or bigger if food is scarce. In that territory, the female fox produces one litter of three to 10 cubs each year. Within four months, the cubs will grow from babies to mature adults. And then these young foxes must leave their parents in search of their own territories. This cycle of life continues each and every year. The new mature adult foxes will find their own territories and mate and have cubs of their own. If they all stayed in the same territory, there would not be enough food for everyone. There would be fighting, disease, and starvation. When a species such as the fox is overabundant, there are too many for nature to feed. The number of animals that a territory can support is known as the carrying capacity. But not all habitats are equally suited to supporting wildlife, and not all species have the same needs. How can we tell if the carrying capacity of a habitat is appropriate? Let's take a look at these four images of both beaver and fox habitats. In this picture, we see a lake and a beaver dam. We do not see many aquatic plants that beavers need in large quantities. The trees around this pond are evergreens, and beavers do not eat evergreens. This is an example of a beaver habitat that is not well suited for beaver. There were not enough of the deciduous trees, especially birch and willow, that they need to eat. So once those were gone, the beavers left too. Now look at this picture. Here we have a beaver lodge, dark and covered with fresh mud, a sign that the beavers are very active. There are lots of aquatic plants for beavers to eat and a forest full of delicious deciduous trees. Yum. Here, the habitat is rich and beavers are abundant. Now look at this photo, a big field where there are thousands of small mice, rats, and moles that make their nests in the ground. The red fox will certainly be abundant. Also, the thick forest has good hideouts for foxes and their cubs. And notice the barn. There are human beings around who will gladly accept the presence of a few foxes that could eliminate hundreds of mice and rats. Rodents that will try to invade our homes and barns in the winter. 
This is an example of a rich habitat for foxes. On the other hand, in this picture, we see a dense, mature boreal forest. With all those big trees, not much light gets to the ground for the plants to grow. So the tender vegetation that rodents need would be scarce. So this would not normally be a good fox habitat. But look, humans have cut a road through the forest. With big machinery, they have loosened the soil. The light comes in along the road, allowing some vegetation growth. Thanks to this human intervention, some small rodents may come to feed and live, and they will attract some foxes, although not in big numbers. So this is a good example of a habitat that will support some foxes, but not in abundance. Nature is all about balance. We all know that if the population of foxes falls below a certain number, that can be a bad thing. If an animal population falls too far, it can become endangered, and no one wants that. The opposite is also true as well. An overabundance in the population of foxes can be a bad thing for both humans and the animals. Remember, our territory can only support a certain number of foxes. What will happen to the young foxes born each year? Unable to find territories of their own can result in fighting, starvation, and disease. And wildlife diseases like rabies spread faster when populations are too dense, endangering domestic animals and even pets. In nature, predators play an important role in controlling an animal's population. Wolves, for example, prey on both foxes and beavers. But humans are predators in the ecosystem too. It makes sense to have regulated hunting and trapping seasons to help reduce the population of a certain species to a number that nature can support before they damage their environment or spread disease. If we have to control the populations of some species, we believe it is more respectful to use these animals for a good purpose. Some, like the fox, have warm and beautiful fur that can be used to make clothing. Some animals, like beavers or muskrats, we can also eat. We can use some of the surplus that nature produces to create things that we need and use. This is called the responsible and sustainable use of wildlife. Government regulations ensure that we use only part of what nature produces, so the populations of beavers and foxes and other animals remain stable and healthy. The sustainable and responsible use of wildlife and other renewable resources is promoted by environmental authorities like the World Conservation Union. Using animals for food or clothing is only okay if it is sustainable. Sustainability means that these animal populations will remain here long after we are gone. So, what did we learn today? One, there are two types of natural resources, renewable and non-renewable resources. Two, fur-bearing animals are an example of a renewable natural resource. Three, animals have adapted to the type of environment where they live. Foxes are terrestrial animals. Beavers are semi-aquatic animals. Four, some animals, like beavers, are herbivores. Others, like foxes, are carnivores. Five, animals need a certain amount of space and resources to live. This is called the carrying capacity of a habitat. Six, because most species produce more young than their habitat can support, we can use part of this surplus. This is called sustainable use of renewable resources. If we protect nature, the responsible and sustainable use of fur bearers will continue to provide a valuable renewable natural resource for many generations to come.